I would like to welcome everyone to this wonderful ninth annual Hall of Fame dinner and induction ceremony. I would also like to extend a particular greeting to our extraordinary inductees and their families, friends, and teammates. Pat, Eugene, Robert, Ned, Keith, and Margaret represent the very best the university has to offer in a special and historical field of endeavor. From a very, very long tradition of superb intercollegiate athletes and coaches who date back to the very birth of intercollegiate athletics in this country. This year's Hall of Fame inductees, the class is genuinely remarkable. They include four All-Americans, three NCAA postgraduate award winners, remarkable, three out of a class of, of seven, two conference champions, one academic All-American, one Olympian, and one NCAA National Player of the Year. They have managed to separate themselves from the pack with remarkable commitment, dedication, hard work, and of course sheer athletic talent to achieve genuine excellence. The university, of course, is accustomed to honoring excellence, but a place so singularly dedicated to intellectual accomplishment, it is remarkable that we come together tonight to honor excellence in another area, competitive athletics. And it is even more remarkable that these inductees have achieved this level of excellence, all while engaging in what, in what might be the most challenging liberal arts curriculum in the country. It is a testimony to their own balance and a classically Greek sense of proportion they brought to both their academic and competitive lives here on the Midway. Our core civ courses, hate to mention those, but our core civ courses, of course, teach us that the ancient Greeks understood notions of harmony and proportion and remind us that they believe that athletes deserve honor because in their striving for excellence, they performed a kind of civic function by teaching the rest of us something important about worthy things like courage, beauty, grace, harmony, commitment, and hard work. In this most academic of environments, it is worth noting that the classical Greeks understood that athletic excellence was not merely some lowbrow pursuit to be disdained by the more sophisticated, but could be ennobling and an important part of any civilized culture. Watching our inductees compete was literally good for our souls because it allowed each of us to appreciate the virtue of excellence while at the same time enlarging our own spirits. I should also note that our current athletes and coaches are trying hard to uphold the tradition set by our great inductees here tonight. A couple of highlights and achievements from the past year in intercollegiate athletics at the University of Chicago. Again, we had two NCAA postgraduate scholars last year, one academic All-American, 14 All-Americans, seven, co seven conference players of the year, and a remarkable 247 all-conference academic athletes. And finally, the department placed 20, 27th nationally among 447 NCAA Division III institutions in the NACTA Director's Cup standing, standings measuring overall athletic excellence. Congratulations to our current athletes, yeah. That's, that's well deserved and with any luck, there are some future Hall of Famers in that current athlete class. I would be remiss in not taking a moment to recognize some of the folks who make this evening one of the very best alumni events of the year. First, I'm going to call on all our past Hall of Fame inductees to stand. Past inductees, would you please stand?
Well-deserved, well-deserved. Mitch Watkins, Kelly Osler, Mary Jean Mulvaney, Joel Zemans, Bill Gray, Ann Harvella, and I think Dan Phillips, I'm not sure if he's here tonight, are all here and to be congratulated. I would also like the presidents of the Graduate Order of the Sea and the Women's Athletic Association to stand, Dennis Walden, and I'm not sure if Virginia, Korak, and Kelly Brown are here tonight, but Dennis, I know you're here. Dennis. <laughs> they do important work on behalf of these two associations and deserve our appreciation. Uh, John Craig, our NCAA faculty representative, please stand. John is an associate professor of history here and represents our 625 athletes as our NCAA faculty rep. He does a wonderful job supporting them, writing numerous letters of recommendation for postgraduate honors and attending more than his share of games and, of course, track meets. Our current athletes, we have a number of current athletes. Please stand if you're a current athlete. Ah, it makes us feel uh, wistful. We welcome you tonight. In the not too distant future, you can return to this event and tell outrageous lies about your own athletic accomplishments, just as our alumni are doing here tonight. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our Vice President for Campus and Student Life and Dean of Students in the University, Kim Goff Cruz, who is representing the university here tonight. Kim? Thank you, Tom. I just love this event. This is one of my favorite events in the year. This and the Order of the Sea and Wa, the, um, those, those events are really wonderful to celebrate athletes. So yeah, you can give a hand for that because they are really well, wonderful. <laughs> So I'm, I'm here to represent the institution. I'm here on behalf of President Zimmer, who couldn't be with us tonight, uh, to welcome you to the Hall of Fame dinner. And as I said, this is one of my favorite events. I want to uh, give a special welcome to our inductees who are going to be inducted formally tonight, and of course to their family and friends, because we know without their family and friends throughout the years, they wouldn't be able to accomplish what they did when they were here in the field, um, and also what they've done since they've left us. So we want to thank you um, particularly. I also want to take a, a moment to acknowledge those who are representing two of our inductees who are actually getting their awards posthumously. Um, that would be Ned Miriam from the class of 1980, of, sorry, 1908, I'm sorry, and Keith Parsons from 1933. Uh, they have representatives here and we want to particular, particularly acknowledge them. Now, I am sure that many of you have followed UChicago Athletics over the years, and you know that interest has waxed and waned um, for, uh, over the years for some time. But you understand the value of maroon athletics, and so your interest has been really consistent. At the university, we speak of scholar athletes, and in other words, we really focus on the sound mind and the sound body. But we know that we have had a tremendous, as Thomas said, um, interest in our athletes over the years. And this year, 625 athletes are playing in a wide variety of varsity sports. But even those who aren't in athletics, in, in um, varsity sports, are also really embracing the, uh, the, the, the um, imprimatur of scho scholar athletes, but also sound mind and sound body. We have 1,100 students who are participating in club sports, and 6,200, another 6,200 who are actually participating in intramural sports on campus as well. And that makes us one of the most uh, robust Academic, uh, academic and athletic programs in the country. Uh, so it's not just that it's varsity athletics, but it's athletics for athletics' sakes in general. So increasingly, we see that our student body is focused on stretching their minds, but also their bodies. And certainly, our varsity athletes lead the way. Tom always speaks to me at the end of the year about the evaluations that, the, that he reads from the athlete, athletes. He reads all 625 every year, um, which is quite a bit. But one of the things that he says to me is, is a consistent theme um, that they mention, and that is a sense of community that they get in their teams, the value that they place on being part of something that's much larger than themselves. 
We know that's a universal feeling for the athletes across gender and sport. And I suspect that for you, when you were playing and when you come back to these events, you recognize the value of community as well. It was a community of athletes, but it's also a community of wonderful alumni. Our sports give us the opportunity to uh, point out for the broader student community an opportunity to actually come together to celebrate something big, something, a common cause, a common uh, reason to win, whether it's basketball or volleyball or soccer or football tomorrow. Um, we want to come together, that's right, I plan on, we plan on winning. Um, we have the opportunity to come together as a community as, of a whole, all the faculty, students and staff and alumni to celebrate sport. But tonight, we get to have the opportunity to celebrate sport in a different way, to honor all of those who are joining the Hall of Fame this year. We celebrate your contributions on the field for inter intercollegiate athletics, but also the development of sport at this particular institution. Yes, you have intellectual rigor and academic commitment. You, have it, you had it when you were here and you have it um, in your lives. But tonight we really want to honor you and truly, really honor you for your athleticism, your competition, and what you brought to us as a community. You are an important reason why we are who we are, and we are very, very proud of all of you, each and every one of you. And it's my great pleasure again to congratulate all the inductees, and I want to thank you for inviting me to this in celebration. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Lester Munson. I'm delighted to welcome back our Hall of Fame Master of Ceremonies tonight. A word about Lester. Um, if you don't know, he's the star of each and every Hall of Fame we've done since the very inception of Hall of Fame dinners. Lester earned his JD from the University of Chicago Law School in 1967. After several years in politics and law, Mr. Munson entered the field of investigative and legal affairs reporting. He served on the staff of Sports Illustrated from 1991 to 2007. He is now a writer, producer, and legal analyst at ESPN and ESPN.com. Using a neat combination of journalistic and investigative skills and courtroom experience, Lester has reported on legal issues in sports for over 18 years. He digs into criminal charges against sports celebrities. He analyzes labor issues that divide team owners and players. He describes the dynamics of money, celebrity, race, politics, economics, drugs, gambling, and violence. Is there anything more you want to add to that list, Lester? <laughs> in a sports industry and a business that commands a larger audience than any other in America. As a senior writer and le legal analyst for ESB.com, his current and recent assignments include the congressional hearings on the steroid era in baseball, Roger Clemens and Miguel Tejada prosecutions, the prosecution of NFL star Michael Vick on dogfighting charges, gambling charges against an NBA referee, the Barry Bonds perjury trial, the Roger Clemens mistrial, the Lance Armstrong perjury investigation, and the Dodgers turmoil in the McCourt divorce settlement. Using his legal training and expertise, Lester is able to gather and analyze material not often found in routine sports coverage. He is able to put criminal charges and civil litigation in the sports industry into context that give new insights into each and into the American pop culture. Mr. Munson has received numerous awards and his work has appeared in the series Best American Sports Writing. He lives in Chicago with his wife Judith, an attorney specializing in international public health issues. I always like to observe that Lester's professional life is, a kind, of, is kind of perverse in that he's happiest when all of our various social pathologies are running rampant. Uh, please join me in welcoming Lester Munson. Now that you've heard uh, Tom 
inventory the work that I do, you can easily imagine what a privilege it is for me to be involved in something like this, where everything goes well. It's a very uh, different kind of area for me. Um, I do want to start tonight by attempting to establish some level of credential. Uh, many of you are here for the first time, and you're wondering why would a great university like this invite a hack writer, a, no, a sports writer actually, to be an MC uh, at an event of this uh, dignity and magnitude. And in order to establish some level of credibility, I've got to tell you a little bit about ESPN. And I am able tonight to give you some information that is not public. Uh, I don't mind at all if you talk about it, but I do have something, I think, that gives you a sense of why we at ESPN are beginning to take ourselves perhaps more seriously than we should. We are now, ESPN is now, the official television network of the White House. <laughs> I assume that you're not too surprised about this. We always call ourselves the worldwide leader in sports, but now, President Barack Obama, in his third year of his first term, has said, yes, ESPN is the official network of my White House. Now, if you think about it, it should not surprise you. When President Obama was going to make a very important speech about jobs, what did he do? He scheduled it around a National Football League game. He, he scheduled his speech so that he would not interfere with opening night in the National Football League. What else has he done recently? He invited the 1985 Chicago Bears into the White House. Think about this, the 1985 Chicago Bears. Their championship was 26 years ago, and this means he's inviting into the White House the likes of Steve McMichael, known among football players as Mongo because of his animal tendencies, and Jim McMahon the quarterback who generally shows up barefoot in various situations. He invites into the White House two athletes who are barely housebroken, so we know that he is interested in sports. In March, he spent one hour on our network making his NCAA basketball picks. Did you watch this? It was embarrassing. He knew more about East Carolina than our college basketball reporters knew. Um, the, so we're not surprised. Previous presidents have spent their time watching CNN, MSNBC. Remember on 9-11, we saw pictures of George Bush and Dick Cheney watching the towers collapsing on CNN. But here in this White House, we, ESPN, are the official network. This began in the 2008 campaign uh, when he was running first against Hillary Clinton and then against John McCain. He kept showing up in Bristol, Connecticut, the headquarters of ESPN. They, the campaign people would always say, well, we happened to be driving by, and we thought we'd come in, and maybe we could get on one of your programs. Bristol, Connecticut is not near anything. You have to go an hour out of your way to get to Bristol, Connecticut. We couldn't get rid of this guy during that campaign. He would show up, he'd want to play one-on-one -on -one basketball, or three on three. Whenever he wanted to play three on three, he brought with him Arne Duncan. Arne Duncan is 6'9 and is a phenomenal basketball player. Why is he the Secretary of Education? Because he's 6'9, that's why, it's very simple. Um, so they would play three on three. We have an anchor, some of you are familiar with him, named Stuart Scott. Stuart Scott Whenever he realized the Obama campaign was coming on to the ESPN campus, Stewart would run and hide. He had had such a terrible time playing one-on-one -on -one with Barack Obama that he never wanted to see the man again. Um, Obama, I'm not sure you're supposed to say this about the President of the United States, but Barack Obama, our president, is very good at trash talking on the basketball court. And he would terrorize Stuart Scott. He would say, Stuart, you know I'm going to my left. I'm going to destroy you now. And then, and then he would, which would make Stuart uh, very unhappy. So he was hiding. In that summer of 2008, I was sitting 
quietly at a summer place that Judy and I have in northern Vermont. The phone rings, and it's a guy from the Obama campaign. They were getting ready for their convention. Remember the convention in Denver, Colorado, when he became the official nominee? And they were trying to plan the staging of all the events. This was during the Olympics in Beijing. While Obama was winning the nomination, Michael Phelps was winning all those gold medals. And so the Obama campaign thought, well, here's what we need. We got to get Michael Phelps to come and join us at the convention. So they call me thinking I can find Michael Phelps for him. As it turns out, that's the kind of thing I can do. I, I, I gave them the phone numbers of Michael Phelps' agent, his manager, and Michael himself so that they could say, please join us the Democratic nominee for president at our convention. Now, Michael Phelps at that time was the hottest commodity in sports marketing. The last thing he was going to do was get involved in partisan politics. He wants to sell things to both Democrats and Republicans. He doesn't just want to sell things, so he turned them down. But it cost me a day and a half trying to respond to the Obama campaign so that they could uh, try to get Michael Phelps to come to their convention. Uh, I do know for sure that we are the official network. Everybody you talk to in the White House says the president watches one television show, Sports Center. It is the crown jewel of our programming. I have very good sources for that. I'm a journalist. I should protect my sources, so I'm only going to give you their initials. David Axelrod, Rahm Emanuel, Norman Eisen, and Bob Woodward. I have talked to all of these people about what happens in the White House, and they agree on one thing. Don't get between the president and Sports Center if you know what's good for you. The, David Axelrod, as some of you know, is one of his political strategists. He is now back in Chicago. He's working on the campaign. And we had dinner one night, and I asked him, David, what about this? You're back in Chicago. Can you just work on the campaign, or does the White House try to involve you and all the things that go on there. What, what is your day like? And he takes out his Blackberry and he shows it to me and there are a series of email messages forth and back between the President of the United States and David Axelrod. 14 emails. Now this would take, what, 35 to 40 minutes for these emails to exchange. And what was the issue that they were emailing forth and back about? Is Derek Rose an elite player? This is what they were talking about in their emails. Um, the Obama does have a speech that he gives in which he encourages parents to become involved in the lives of their children. And, and one of the riffs in the speech is limit your children's television. If they're watching ESPN Sports Center, turn it off. This is exactly what he says. And we felt our feelings were hurt at ESPN when we realized that's what he was saying. But then we also we, we figured out why he's doing that. That's the only television show that he knows to mention. It's the only thing he watches. So he had to do that. Um, the, I think he might like us at ESPN because he has this terrible unemployment situation. And we are one big company that is hiring like crazy. Right now, ESPN is enjoying incredible growth. We're in a golden era. We have six networks. We have 330 radio stations. We have a website that has more traffic than all other sports websites uh, put together. Here's a really scary statistic. 107 million people watch one of our networks each week. I think we have to do something different in this country. Um, most of these people spend 56 minutes a day either watching our programs or on our website. Here's another thing that's a little scary. We employ 26 former National Football League players and coaches. 26. You've seen some of them on television. We have five coaches. Mike Ditka, Herman Edwards, John Gruden, Eric Mangini, and Bill Parcells. There's a large cafeteria in the ESPN campus. Another place you don't want to be is near the cafeteria line when Mike Golick and some of these other football players come in for lunch. That's a very dangerous spot. 
Um, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the company, we have just made a deal for Monday Night Football that uh, involves a payment of $1.9 billion. That's B, as in banana. Um, my work right now, uh, Tom mentioned some of the things I'm doing. I'm working on my fourth lockout. This is the fourth time in my career that owners of professional teams have locked out their players. It happened first in baseball in 1995, then hockey where they lost an entire season uh, to a lockout, then the NFL, which came close to losing some games, and now the NBA, which is in serious trouble. Um, but let me just give you a couple of news flashes, and then we'll get to uh, our inductions. Uh, although the players and the owners are fighting in the NBA, it appears that the National Labor Relations Board is about to make a ruling in favor of the players. It could end the lockout. It could solve a problem that the players and the owners themselves uh, cannot handle. There's a column that I have on our website right now explaining this if you're interested. If you happen to have season tickets to the Bulls, you might be encouraged when you read that column. Um, the second uh, news item, uh, Tom mentioned it, the Lance Armstrong investigation in Los Angeles is heating up. It appears that they're preparing to indict him for perjury involving the use of drugs, uh, steroid drugs, and blood doping in the Tour de France uh, victories. So those are the things that I'm working on right now. The, tonight is our ninth induction ceremony. We're going to induct seven people tonight. That will make a total of 83 in the Hall of Fame. And we are here to celebrate uh, a great college athletics program. Everybody who studies college sports in America, academics and others, agree that this is the model of what an athletic program should be. It's comprehensive, it's competitive, it is all that is good in college sports and none of the bad. We have student athletes here who are actually students and athletes. Uh, my favorite observation on these issues comes from David Boren. He is the president of Oklahoma University. He looks at it from a different point of view. It was he who said, we are trying to build a university that our football team can be proud of. <laughs> we take a little different approach. Uh, we are doing things the right way here, and I am proud to be a part of it. Um, the, tonight, we will honor two soccer players, two basketball, two in track, two from football and one swimmer. That does not add up to seven, but that's because we have some people who played two sports. Within the group, we have three lawyers, three PhDs, and a coach. Um, our first inductee, when he came to this campus for the first time, was a high school senior. He went to watch soccer practice. They were practicing in Washington Park at that time. He met the coach, John O'Connor, and after about 10 minutes, uh, he left. He said he had to meet somebody. And the coach concluded that Patrick Berry had very little interest in soccer. Patrick Berry then became the greatest surprise in the history of the university soccer program. Uh, he is a very determined player. Although he was not recruited, he became an All-American playing here at the university. He is the first male to be inducted into the Hall of Fame as a soccer player. Uh, how could this be? We're at, all the way up to 83 and we haven't had a male soccer player. Um, there is a problem involving soccer among people who follow sports. At ESPN, we're gradually moving into the world of soccer. There's great resistance among sports writers to that. Um, I'm afraid I am in that generation of sports writers that has difficulty understanding the game of soccer. The clock appears to be going backwards. I don't begin to understand that. Everybody keeps saying all these children are playing soccer. It's going to become a major sport. They've been saying that for nearly 40 years, and it's a college sport. Why are all these children playing soccer? I think it's because then they don't have to watch it. But we are honoring a soccer player tonight because he is one of the greatest athletes that we have had. Um, he had a great picture of what was going on 
on the field. He had a brilliant, what they call, soccer brain. He saw what was happening. He knew what the next thing to do was. He was able to execute it, and he was also able to change the flow of the game uh, when necessary. He could make adjustments on the fly that most players could not make. He was a natural left footer. This is something that coaches look for in soccer, and he embodies all that we are doing here in this athletics program. His academic accomplishments are breathtaking. He is finishing a PhD at Michigan in English literature. He is also a student here in the law school where he is on the law review. That's three full-time jobs right there. PhD in English literature, law student, and law review. I, of course, was never on the law review. That's for the top students. But I do know they work very hard. On top of this, he trained and succeeded and completed in Louisville an Ironman triathlon. He, he trained six times per week uh, because he was interested in seeing how much he could do. Are you aware of what an Ironman triathlon is? The first thing you do is you swim 2.4 miles. You get out of the water, you get on your bike, and you ride 112 miles, and then you run a marathon. Almost impossible to conceive of, much less do, but he did it. He had done five marathons before that. Um, he is going to finish the law school here uh, in the middle of next year. He will then finish his PhD, and he is then planning on doing a clerkship in one of the courts. We already have a member of this Hall of Fame who clerked for the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, John Roberts. His name is Mark Mosier, a baseball player. You saw him on the slides. I think I can predict safely that this inductee, Patrick Berry, uh, will be a clerk on the United States Supreme Court as well. He has played professional soccer. He played in Scotland. And while he was playing in Scotland, he worked as a janitor. Uh, here's a PhD in English literature working as a janitor. They've already done the movie Good Will Hunting, but if they hadn't, they, he could be the star of that movie. So help me welcome Patrick Berry. Hi, Patrick. Good to see you. Good to see you. Okay. I can lend more credibility to Mr. Munson's investigative reporting. The janitor bit is not on my resume, so I'm impressed that he found that out. Um, but I, I do want to say thank you to everybody here. Uh, I, as Mr. Munson said, I'm over at the law school, and last week I got to be a part of a winning case, which was really, really neat. And I remember the supervising attorney said, just think about all the things that had to go right for this to happen. He said, we had to get the right judge, <laughs> we had to have the right research team, and we had to have the right client. And so for tonight, I thought to myself, just how much had to go right for this to happen? I had to have the right coach, one who took a chance on a walk-on and didn't cut him when he hurt himself, celebrating a goal his first year. <laughs> I had to have the right teammates who didn't really care that I didn't play defense <laughs> and certainly cared enough to show up tonight. And I had to have the right family, uh, not only my parents who shuttled me back and forth to soccer games since I was about four years old, but also my sister Kathleen who shuttled herself from Lincoln Park to Stag Field <laughs> way too many times for someone in their 20s. <laughs> and I think even one time she stood up a date so that she could come to one of my soccer games. Fortunately, the date she stood up actually turned out to be a nice guy and is actually here tonight, and they got married, and so that worked out. <laughs> but, but I appreciate her efforts and everybody else's efforts all the same. Thank you. Our next inductee is the greatest rebounder in basketball history here at the university. 
He was an All-American on a team in 1963 that is among the best teams ever in the history of this basketball program. Uh, he is the second player from that team to enter the Hall of Fame, Joel Zemans, uh, who was the top scorer on that team, uh, was inducted uh, a few years ago. Our chairman uh, of our event, John Davey, also played on that team while he was in the law school. I never quite understood that, but somehow that's what they could do back then. Uh, Gene Erickson is a big guy uh, with big hands, but his coach kept telling him to take little steps. Coach Stampf at that time thought that big guys could get into position not by taking these giant steps that you see Shaquille O'Neal doing, but by taking little steps. That's a coaching idea that never really caught hold anywhere else. Um, but there were not many guys Gene's size playing basketball then, and he was able to dominate uh, games. Uh, the team did get into a final eight. They're playing in Evansville, Indiana. This was a pinnacle of the career of a wonderful group of basketball players. And there was a meeting before the game that would make history, and Coach Stamp was in front of the chalkboard, and he was outlining a very intricate defense. And it went on and on, and he had the X's, and he had the O's, and he was explaining how this defense would work, and you should be here, and you should be there, and he had all these diagrams on the chalkboard. Everybody was very tense. It was a very nervous, anxious atmosphere, and when the coach finally finished his exegesis on this intricate defense, Gene Erickson said, uh, Coach, let me ask you something. Are we the X's or the O's? There, there's another story, it's possibly apocryphal, about Gene. There were, they were waiting to get on a plane. Now, some of you are old enough to remember this. At one time, there was, in airports and in other public buildings, pay toilets. You would have to put a dime in to get inside the booth in the toilet. We don't see them anymore. I think they were banned by a constitutional amendment or something. But um, the pay toilet was there. Gene, as you're about to see, is tall, and he likes to help people, and so people who would come in, he was able to use his long arm and reach down and open it from the inside, thereby providing one of the great social services that he invented all by himself. Um, the, he was a math major. He completed a PhD in applied statistics. Uh, he served as a professor at Temple University in Philadelphia. Uh, and has only recently retired. The, uh, he has served as an expert witness in numerous situations. I can just see the lawyers, when they see a guy six feet eight coming in to be the expert witness, if you don't think that has some effect on the lawyer, uh, believe me, he, he would be a tough guy to cross-examine. Gene Erickson. I got just a couple things to say. First of all, I got a group of teammates at table number six, and there's another group of teammates. I'm sitting back there, I think it's table number 12. And whatever we did, we did as a group. Now, back in the spring of 1963, I was trying to decide which college I wanted to go to. And I'd applied to Princeton, I'd been accepted at Princeton. The Princeton basketball coach wrote to me and said, since you got at Princeton, we know you got in to every other school you could conceivably have applied to. After that, I came to the University of Chicago. And the thing about the University of Chicago is that it was not Princeton. And I will I find out I was a major in math. I don't think that I ever had a math professor who was aware that we had a basketball team. <laughs> and I can tell you 
that my basketball coach, who was an amazingly astute coach, had a clue about mathematics. So I went through the university with a bifurcated personality. Now we all thought that if the world were different, we'd be Division I basketball players. And our coach encouraged that. So in our junior year, we went down to play Bradley. And Bradley was number five in the country. And we had a special University of Chicago offense. And at the half, we were ahead 20 to 16. Now, don't ask me what the final score was, <laughs> because the second half was quite different. But we really were into our basketball. And after I got back to the dorm, I have to tell you that the University of Chicago was one of the top, it was either the first, second, or third among all the math departments in the world. And I went back to Hitchcock dorm, and my classmates were graduate students from places like the University of Nebraska who'd really done something great to be accepted at the department at the University of Chicago. And I just played three hours of basketball, and all I wanted to do was go to sleep. But in order to compete, that was Division I mathematics. <laughs> Somehow, I graduated. And the skills that I picked up doing that combination of two such different activities has been the key to the life that I had after that. Thank you very much. Our next inductee established himself as a great runner during his four years here. His best event was the 1500 meters. Uh, he was a national qualifier in a number of events. He still holds records in three relays, uh, even to this day. Uh, among his teammates, uh, he was known for his sense of humor. While he was here, he was one of the founders of an improv comedy troupe known as Off Off Campus. It was founded, he, he, it was founded uh, with the assistance of Bernie Salins, who is the iconic uh, inventor of Second City. Uh, they formed their troupe. They're doing improv. Where did they perform? It, it's easy to figure out. Jimmy Wilson's Woodlawn Tap. Where else would they go to perform? Um, I talked to somebody who sat next to him in a course uh, the course was astrophysics. That is a course that is known as Flying Rocks for Jocks. It is a very easy science course. And uh, see, I, yeah. <laughs> I, so, well, this is the University of Chicago. There will be disagreement on this, yeah. Um, th this guy tells me that he was laughing so hard at what Bob Fisher said during the class that he nearly flunked what was supposed to be uh, an easy course. Uh, during his career here, there was a time when, for some reason, he wore under his uniform, under his university track uniform, a sleeveless gray turtleneck. Try to envision this. And it, re it produced ridicule from his teammates. It was one of those styles among athletes that never, ever caught on. Um, he had a decision to make uh, when he graduated. Is he going into performance? improv, drama, comedy, or is he going to do something else? He went to law school here, and as, a, as enough lawyer left in me, and from what I can remember of my days in the courthouse, improv skills will come in handier than research skills. That would be my advice. Um, he is now practicing law in Phoenix, where he lives with his wife and two children, Bob Fisher. Thank you very much, and uh, it's quite an honor to receive uh, 
this induction and this uh, plaque of, I believe, Cantinflas, funniest man of all Mexico. Well, you'll have to see it. Um, but when you do, you'll think of Cantinflas and do a little research and uh, watch Around the World in 80 Days. He's hilarious. Um, I uh, had the privilege of running uh, here at the University of Chicago under the great coach Ted Hayden. Um, Ted himself was not only a great coach and person, but a very funny man, uh, well into his 70s, which gives me 20 plus years to gain a sense of humor. Um, uh, the experiences with our, uh, on our team and under Ted, who um, Aaron Rourke and I were discussing this earlier, I believe Sports Illustrated did a kind of a celebration of Ted, which was intended, I think, to capture the end of his career, but I believe it was from 1973 and we ran under Ted in the mid 80s, uh, and he was still going strong, and uh, it, it was a great honor, and it's a great honor to follow uh, Michael Axon into uh, this Hall of Fame, uh, who uh, went into the national finals in both cross country and track and field, and um, as I look at the news of sports here at the UFC now, and, 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 and see so, um, so many more regular instances of excellence at the highest levels of competition uh, by maroon athletes. Uh, at that time, it was a, it was a, a thrill for me to uh, think of uh, a guy like Mike Ax Axon and think, well, here's somebody who will only come along once every 20 years at the UFC, and then maybe to contribute to the idea that no, it can happen more often. Um, I'm grateful for my teammates who are here tonight, and we're thinking uh, fondly of our friend David Raskin, who's, uh, who's a, a little under the weather, and we wish him our best for a speedy recovery. Um, again, thank you so much. Listening to what Gene Erickson said about going to Princeton or coming to this university, uh, I cannot help but observe, I was at Princeton then when he turned us down, and I was going back in my memory, if he had come to Princeton, he would have played in his senior year with Bill Bradley. But instead, he was able to come here and play with John Davey and Joel Zemans. So all things considered, I think he made the right decision. Um, following on Bob, we have now a uh, a legendary track coach whom we will induct, uh, Ned Merriam. He starred in two sports here as a student. He was a fullback on one of the Stag era football teams. He was a good enough fullback that when he decided not to play his senior year, it was a news story in the Chicago papers. His best sport was track. He ran the quarter mile, uh, the 400 meters, and he ran hurdles, two of the most difficult events uh, and demanding events in all of track and field. He was a Western Conference, that was the predecessor to the Big Ten. He was the conference champion in both of those events. In the quarter mile, the quarter mile is both a sprint and an endurance contest. It is a race that has run full speed, 440 yards, probably the most challenging event in track. He was defeated only once and that defeat came in the Olympics in London in 1908. He placed, but he did not win. Um, he coached track at Texas A&M, at Iowa State, at DePauw, Greencastle, Indiana, and at Yale. When Amos Alonzo Stagg decided to give up coaching track and devote himself totally to football, he called on Ned Merriam to come and replace him as the track coach, and he was here for 21 years. Ted Hayden whom Bob mentioned, was one of his star athletes. Jay Burwanger ran hurdles for Ned Merriam. If you look back on it here, we have had three track coaches, Amos Alonzo Stagg, Ned Merriam, and Ted Hayden. That's over a period of, hundred, of almost 100 years, three of the greatest coaches in the history of college sports. His family here in Hyde Park became a powerful force for reform politics, uh, a nephew, Robert Merriam once ran against the original Mayor Daley, Richard J. Daley. He lost, of course, but he got, he got closer to beating Richard J. Daley than any of the other five people who ran against him 
uh, over the years. Uh, accepting for Ned Miriam is a current star on our track team, another hurdler, and his name is Tyler Callway. <clears throat> You're doing good, Tyler. Tom Weingartner promised Tyler he would not have to say anything. So we <laughs> keep our promises around here. We have had people inducted into this Hall of Fame who have put together sports statistics that defy comprehension. Uh, every year we seem to have one where, as I look at it, I have to make sure I'm reading the numbers correctly. Um, Kelly Osler, who is here tonight, a softball pitcher. I, I'm a baseball fan. I'm a sports writer. I've been working with these kinds of numbers all my life. I've never seen numbers like she put together as a pitcher here at the university. And we have another set of those numbers here tonight. Uh, Renee Nooner scored 78 goals in four years of soccer. It's a record that will not only not be broken, it's not even going to be approached. If you were to rank the top four seasons of all soccer players in the university, she has the top four. She scored 20, 21, 19, and 18 in, four, in each of those four years. The next highest total is 14. The next highest career total, she scored 78, the next highest career total is 40. In 2003, her second year at the university, she scored 21 goals. She was the NCAA Player of the Year. That marked her for her next two years. Even though every team they played knew to watch out for number eight, and they marked her as they do in the sport of soccer, she continued to succeed and she continued to score. She scored in 60% of the games she played, an absolutely incredible record in the sport of soccer. Keep in mind that the girls here play the toughest soccer schedule in the nation. They do not have any easy teams where a player can run up three goals. Uh, during uh, Renee's career here, they made it to the NCAA tournament all four years. They made it to the final four twice, and they played for the national championship in that amazing year of 2003. Over her career, the team won 80% of its games, a winning percentage of 800. I'm a Cub fan. We're happy with 400. Um, I, asked, I asked how did she succeed doing this, and the coaches finally concluded that all Renee needed was 15 seconds and the ball, and she could score. A soccer game, this is one of the things, a soccer game, it can be 90 minutes long, counting backwards. But it, if it, they can mark her for 90 minutes, but if they, if they lose track of her for 10 or 15 seconds, she has the ball, and she has scored. Uh, there was a double overtime game against Puget Sound. The winner of this game was to go to the final four, even though the Puget Sound players had been keeping track of Renee every minute. We're now into the hundreds of minutes. With, with two overtimes, we're up to 110 minutes. She finally found a space. Uh, it's, the soccer term is backside space. I want to show you that I'm learning soccer here. I, I want to. The backside space, and she scored. It was a walk-off goal. Um, she was a phenomenal shot. She, when she shot the ball at the goal, she made three out of six on average. A good soccer player makes one out of six. So this is a different level of soccer player from anything uh, that we've had. She is currently teaching at Northeastern University here in Chicago, and she's coaching uh, at the high school level. Renee Nooner.
Thank you. I'm so sincerely happy to be here tonight. Not only does this occasion provide us all a rare opportunity to say to see Amy Reifer in an outfit other than soccer apparel. <laughs> but the occasion has given me the amazing opportunity to reunite with my former teammates, the incredible student athletes that truly made this honor possible. I genuinely cherish our time together on the field, and I equally hold dear the opportunity to reconnect. I want to thank the University of Chicago faculty, staff, alumni, and Athletics Hall of Fame members that have entrusted me with this great honor. I also want to thank three people that have significantly shaped the course of my soccer career and my life. Amy Reifert, as many of you here tonight are already well aware, is more than simply a soccer coach. She is a mentor, a teacher, a friend, and a role model. During my time here at the UFC, she was the first person I turned to while overwhelmed with an existential crisis, and she was the first person to call me out when I wasn't being true to myself. Amy. Your insights, encouragement, criticism, especially the criticism, and your strength have made me a better person, and your impact on my life will remain a part of me forever. I truly can't thank you enough. Finally, my parents, Sharon and Dennis Nooner, two people who never missed an opportunity to teach me the meaning of perseverance. Because of you, I genuinely enjoyed 7.30 a.m. practices in the freezing rain, you both have consistently provided profound encouragement through every decision, failure, and accomplishment. Now, it has been five years since I graduated, but I did a bit of math recently. I calculated that during my four-year soccer career, my parents traveled approximately 39,000 miles to watch me play soccer. This distance is significantly greater than the circumference of the Earth. Mom and Dad, your enduring support for me is sincerely appreciated. This is an amazing privilege, and I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. Our next inductee start, starred in two sports, and while he was at it, graduated Phi Beta Kappa. He was center on the football team. He was center on the basketball team. Even, he was captain of both teams, and he had six letters in those two sports. He played basketball here, even though he had not played in high school, and he became the leading scorer in his last two years. 25 years after his graduation, he was honored in a Sports Illustrated Silver All-American uh, feature that the magazine did at that time. He was one of the 11 who were honored uh, at that time. He, Went to law school here. He graduated during the Depression, found himself looking for a job, along with a lot of other lawyers who could not find work. At one point, he actually offered to work for free at a big firm. Uh, during World War II, he did contract work for the Ordnance Department of the United States Army. When he came back, he started his own law firm here in Chicago, and then later joined the law firm that is now known as Ross and Hardy's, a large, very successful commercial firm, highly respected. He remained a great friend of this university, although he was never happy with the D, with the elimination of football. He served as president of the Alumni Association. He helped to raise money. Uh, his family has continued to come to the university. If you look at the Parsons family, I believe we have from the University of Chicago two MBAs, an MAT, another master's degree, a PhD, and a JD. Not bad for a single family. Uh, Ross Hardy's has remained, his, his law firm has remained a great friend of the law school. Uh, they hire a large number of people from the law school every year. I can recall interviewing there myself. Uh, I bought a new pair of wingtip shoes, if I remember correctly, but I did not get the job offer. So. Um, <laughs> Accepting is his son, Jim Parsons. Well, actually, I'm a little confused. I was told that I had 20 minutes tonight, and from the prior speakers, I gather it's less than that. Is that correct? Um, I actually happen to be the son that went to the law school, so that's why I may not be as brief as others. No, I'm just kidding, really. Um, 
dad lived and played uh, sports in a very different era. He was a tall, lanky guy. Uh, he was just under 6'4", and he weighed about 190 pounds. So he wouldn't have been a big guy in either sport today. Excuse me. I don't think I did that. Uh, but it's interesting, he, in an interview a few years ago, he said that uh, he never lifted weights here. So if, if he'd played today, he might have been a little heavier because he probably would have lifted weights. Uh, but I think it's interesting to note that the sports were very different back then, particularly football. Uh, we probably wouldn't recognize the game that he played today. Uh, many of the offensive plays that they used aren't used any longer. In fact, Dad once said that he rarely snapped the ball to the quarterback. So as a center, he very rarely snapped to the quarterback. And I don't really understand that, but that's what he said. Uh, while we might not recognize the game, I think we have to recognize that doesn't mean it was any easier a sport. They still hit each other really hard, and they had leather helmets and no face mask and very little padding. So it was a pretty tough day out in the football field. The players also had to display a lot of endurance. After all, the offensive team and the defensive team were one and the same. Uh, in those days, going both ways, I guess, had a little different meaning. <laughs> the, uh, the long train trips were a little different, too. Back in those days, they took trips to places like Yale. So they got on the train, and they went out to Yale, and they took the train all the way back. So it wasn't easy during those times. But uh, to be honest, some of the things really haven't changed too much. Uh, the lessons that they learned on the field and off the field uh, were really huge. Dad often talked about the values the old man, that's Amos Alonzo Stagg, used to promote with his players. Dad said that Stagg was actually as much a teacher as he was a coach. And playing for Stagg was no small deal. Uh, no one really wanted to screw up in the face of a living legend. Uh, and you always wanted to make sure that you were never called a jackass, or as Dad said, a triple jackass, which was Stagg's way of telling people they'd really screwed up. <laughs> both Stagg and Dagg's basketball coach, Nels Norgren, are both members of the Hall of Fame, and that's for very, very good reason. Uh, regardless of the records that those teams had in any given year, the teams they coached were really exceptional. Uh, why do I say that? Well, they must have been, as I know, that Dad's experience with collegiate athletics here at Chicago played a huge role in shaping the rest of his life. He loved referring to the university as the university in our house, and that's the way we grew up knowing it. That's why we all came back. And he would have been incredibly honored to be inducted into the Hall of Fame tonight. I can assure you, and I can see him right now, he would have been all smiles. Uh, on behalf of my siblings, only one of whom could make it tonight, and Dad's seven grandchildren and one great-grandchild, I'd like to thank the Selection Committee for honoring Dad in this wonderful way. Thank you very much. No one trained any harder than our next and our final inductee tonight. Uh, it was not easy for her to train here. She was a swimmer. She was here during the era of the notorious Bartlett Pool, uh, a pool that was 20 yards long uh, that was barely adequate for training. Occasionally, while Margaret Pizer was here, they would travel to the UIC, University of Illinois Chicago Pool, closer to downtown. It's a 50-meter pool, eight lanes wide, just like the pool now in the Ratner Center. They would do that in the evening. They would finish at 10 o'clock. They'd be back on the campus around 11 o'clock, and then they would be back in the Bartlett Pool at 6 o'clock the next morning, and Margaret never missed a practice. Her coaches were amazed at how hard she could train. Basically, she could swim any event. Her, the records that she set, many of which still stand, were primarily in distance freestyle events, 200 yards, 500 yards, and 1,650 yards, the standard events uh, in swimming at that time. She also, when needed, swam the 400-yard individual medley. 
co the coaches had to devise workouts to challenge her. At one point, hoping to elevate her even higher into the ranks of elite swimmers, they had her swimming repeat 100-yard sprints to make sure that she was producing on each of these sprints. She would do eight or 10 of them. They had a different swimmer swim alongside her to make her go faster and faster. The men's swimmers would do one of these 100-yard sprints with her and, and get out of the pool. Then another one would come in and she could beat them all. It was an incredible demonstration. She swam 60 races in her senior year. She came in third three times. She came in second twice, all the rest, she came in first. Four times, she was an All-American. She was the UAA Swimmer of the Year. While she was doing all of this, she excelled in the biology department. Um, she now lives in Maine, where she is working as a science writer, and she's the mother of two young children, two years and three months old. She is unable to be with us tonight. But here is what she told us. Uh, to read as part of her induction. When I entered the University of Chicago in 1993, I went from being known as that smart girl valedictorian and nerd to being known as that swimmer who broke all of the records. This new identity, combined with the unique academic and social environment at Chicago, gave me a new source of confidence that I could both fit in and define myself as I pleased, no matter how quirky my combination of interests and talents might be. The confidence and flexibility I learned set me on the right track to balancing my current eclectic mix of identities as a versatile science writer, an editor, an athlete, and a mom. The, uh, let's have a hand for this class, an amazing class of inductees. Thank you. I just, um, I just want to observe that uh, Lester makes an extraordinary commitment to this event each year. And um, I know that because uh, there was no work uh, done in my department today because Lester was peppering virtually everyone in the department with emails and phone calls gathering information for this. Uh, so uh, how about a great round of applause for Lester Munson. <laughs> Lester, we, we thank you for your, your, uh, your great sense of humor, your extraordinary insight, and the great commitment you have to the University of Chicago and uh, the athletes here. Thank you very much. Uh, the, we get great support from the uh, Alumni and Development Office here each year, uh, throughout the year, and for this event. And I've been instructed to, uh, to keep this introduction short, but Damon, I'm sorry, I've already written it, so uh, we're going to have to go with uh, the inter introduction I have down. In early uh, 2011, Damon Cates rejoined the University of Chicago as Associate Vice President of Alumni Relations and Annual Giving and Executive Director of the Alumni Association. That title alone is, takes a few minutes to read. Damon has worked in higher education since 1996 and has held various alumni relations and annual giving positions. Most recently, he was the Executive Director of the University of Pennsylvania Fund, prior to that, to that, the director of the uh, Stanford Fund, and finally Damon earned his undergraduate degree at Millican University, his MBA at Chicago Booth, and his doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania. I see Damon standing there. Please welcome Damon Cates. Thank you, Tom. It's a, a, a real pleasure to be here. I often um, am invited to alumni events, and it's a real pleasure to interact with all of our alumni and to represent the Alumni Association, but it's truly a special honor to be here this evening, to be here with um, all of you, and particularly our inductees. But 
On behalf of the University of Chicago Alumni Association, I want to also extend my sincere congratulations to all the inductees. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a truly testament to um, our alumni community and, and, and how strong we are. Um, we are proud of all of our alumni, um, especially those um, who have been honored here this evening, um, but are also especially proud of their accomplishments both on and off the field. And it's wonderful to see so many of you here this evening in support and in celebration of the University of Chicago Athletics Program, which too is also a, a true testament to um, um, what is alive and well and vibrant when we talk about the University of Chicago family. So I hope you'll continue the celebration later this evening. Um, the Alumni Association is sponsoring um, a reception at the Quad Club right across the street, so please join us afterwards. And um, I, I hope you'll be able to, to continue the celebration there. And um, it's now my pleasure, I think, to introduce, um, oh, that Tom's going to do that. So someone who is a, a very, very much a part of the University of Chicago family and I uh, care a lot about, but I'll let Tom introduce him. So thank you very much, everyone, and congratulations again to the inductees. I wanted to say something about John. That's all right. That's all right. Well, I, I didn't want Damon to steal my thunder. I, I like talking about John Davey. Special thanks to John, who is the chairman of our Hall of Fame Selection Committee and who so diplomatically chairs what are always interesting Hall of Fame voting meetings. You're not... Always good for the front page. Keep talking. <laughs> In his chairman's role, John has been the most deft, sensitive, and knowledgeable committee chairman I could imagine. John is one of the university's most loyal and supportive alumni. He is a graduate of both the college and the law school and was the winner of the prestigious Stag Medal in 1961. John has also served as president of the Order of the Sea and on the college's visiting committee and has been one of the prime movers in the creation of the Hall of Fame, having served on both the Hall of Fame Bylaws Committee and then as chair of the Hall of Fame Selection Committee. In honor of his many years of good work on behalf of the university and its student athletes in particular, John received the university's prestigious alumni service citation several years ago. Please welcome John Davey. Uh, this is the thank you session. First of all, thanks Lester, because I, this is always fun. I thank everybody who came because this is an important event and the way you really know it's important is because of the people we induct and how they speak. It's terrific. If you don't understand how important that is to give our athletic programs the support they need, to know that people who come out of there are this sensitive to what they got here, well, it's terrific. Anyway, I want to thank my committee who helped select all these people. I want to thank Ellen Perry and all her staff who put this on tonight. There's somebody known Clara Carlin who you don't even know, but I'd like to thank her because she did a lot for this. Uh, here's my message to you. Send in nomination forms. That's your job. You know what this is about. You know what this is. And if you have people out there you know, we don't know all this on the selection committee. You've got to help us out with all this. We can do some research and all that stuff, but we actually have to get the names. You have to be nominated. You cannot be selected if you aren't nominated. So that's one of those things. Um, tomorrow there's homecoming. Uh, there's a football game. It's going to be a nice event. We uh, apparently have planned for a nice day. The weather will be fine. And we are going to introduce the inductees at halftime, and uh, we would like as many people to come as possible. And uh, we don't have a bad football team, we have a very good football team, and I think you'll see us beat the other team up pretty good. Or I don't know, Coach Maloney told me that earlier. Um, and the, the final thing, which anybody who knows, and I'm a quick talker or something, uh, I take Damon at his word. Join us across the street at the Quadrangle Club and you will get a drink, I think. 
and that will all work out well for you. I thank you all so much for coming and enjoying this evening, and I hope uh, you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you very much. Now, now wait a second. That's, I forgot about the fact that, you know, it's usually the most embarrassing experience of my year, every year, but we have a group here. We have the a cappella group who are going to sing for us, and what they're going to do is they're going to sing a couple of songs, and they're going to sing the alma mater, and we will listen, and we will listen carefully to all the songs, but particularly the alma mater, because when they get done with the alma mater, we will all then rise and sing the alma mater with them, and you don't need to worry, John Davy isn't going to try and do it this year. So, Please rise.